Well, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. I'm Charles Anderson, one of your pastors, reminding you that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And this morning, I want to welcome you to worship. Uh, now, if you visit clearlakemethodist.org slash here, you'll be able to record your attendance with us this morning, as well as view this morning's announcements. Uh, just think of it as an online version of your Sunday newsletter and bulletin. So let me share a few things with you. In contemporary worship, for instance, this morning, we're beginning a series called Plus One. As Christians, we commit ourselves to never walking this journey of faith alone, but we understand three commitments each disciple of Jesus should make in our communal life together. And then in the sanctuary worship, we have two more sermons in our gospel medicine series on faith and healing. And with those two sermons, there'll be special witnesses from some of our healers in our congregation. Now, after these two series conclude, we'll begin our season of Lent, or 40 days before Easter. And we'll mark the beginning of Lent with our Ash Wednesday, our February 17th Ash Wednesday drive-in worship service at 7 p.m. And you won't want to miss this because it is the start of our Lenten season and we will be reunited with a guest preacher, Tony Vincent, with whom I will have the privilege of serving on the cabinet together. Now on Sunday, February 21st, we will have the first Sunday worship services on our parking lot. It's part of a periodic schedule of drive-in worship services on Sunday morning, so you'll want to go ahead and mark your calendars. Now, as the people of God in the worship of God, let's join together in praise and prayer. Dennis Brown, and I've been uh, with the church since 1989. My wife and I joined when we moved here. I was a family physician um, at 
my residency in the Air Force and then spent six years in the Air Force before coming to the Clear Lake area. Uh, recently was on the transition task force for the church and Charles did a wonderful job helping to obtain a lot of the information uh, and then trying to understand it, how to apply it to uh, the church. The most difficult thing is not being able to come together as a full church, but we wanted to make it as safe as possible when we would, when we did come back. Um, hopefully in the next few months, as we get the vaccine, we'll be able to start coming back together. Uh, in my work, it's, my faith has always been an important part of it. The biggest part of it is, is prayer. And mostly prayer by myself and praying for my patients, praying when I go to work. But occasionally I did have um, some opportunities and very good experiences with praying with patients, particularly one elderly patient who we had admitted to the hospital multiple times and we'd get her better and, and um, she would go home. Um, and her last admission, when she came in, she, she just grabbed my hand and I, when I was talking to her about what we're gonna do again and give her diuretics and then get her breathing in, she said, you know, I just don't wanna do that. And I said, okay, and her daughter was there. And so we talked about it and she said, you know, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go to Jesus. And so we said, okay, well, we'll just help you to stay comfortable and we won't do all of the difficult or painful things. And um, so I'd see her every day and I prayed with her there in the room with she and her daughter. And we had her pastors were coming in and um, it was a very difficult time, but it was also a, a happy time too. So uh, that was definitely a time where I saw Jesus in the, in the hospital and in the room with them. Well, once again, good morning, friends. I asked that I might use this morning's generosity moment, well, to thank you for the generosity you have shown in your love and your prayers and your support of Lydia and me over the past five years. As you may know by now, Bishop Jones is appointing me 
as the Northwest District Superintendent of the Texas Annual Conference, effective this coming July 1. Now at that time, Lee and I will be moving to Tyler. It is a tremendous honor and responsibility to be appointed to a district and to the Bishop's Cabinet. But of course, this means saying goodbye to you. I don't know if you realize it, you are the last local congregation that I will ever serve, that I'll ever have. Fortunately for me, you're also the finest one. Working with you reminds me of Jesus' miracle of, of water into wine, where the steward says to the wedding host, most people serve the cheap stuff near the end of the celebration, but you have saved the best for last. And I can tell you it's with all truthfulness that Lydia and I can look upon our five years with you and we can say to our Lord, <laughs> you saved the best for last. And it's in that spirit that I remind you that between now and July, you and I still have ministry to perform, we have needs to meet, we have lives to touch, and yes, we still have miracles to witness. For 41 years now, I have found that we United Methodists actually increase our financial generosity in the transition months between pastors coming and going. Maybe, maybe it's because we know the necessity of a strong ending together. I hope so. Or maybe it's because we want to welcome that incoming pastor, that next incoming pastor with a strong financial foundation for moving forward. I also hope so. So, I invite you to join Lydia and me in one final great season of financial generosity. Between now and July, there is, as I said, still ministry to perform, needs to be met, lives to touch, and miracles to witness. And my hope is that after I leave here, we can all look back on these final months and we can pray a common prayer to God that says, you saved the best for last. Good morning, church. I'm Ashley Fuller, and our passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Hear now the word of God. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment, and if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. 
So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court. With him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm Preston Morgan, one of your pastors. And as a part of our Gospel Medicine series, we are introducing the sermon each week with a liturgical prayer for healing. Many, if not most of these, come from the rich traditions of church history. Today's prayer is from the United Methodist Hymnal. So wherever you are, I invite you to please pray aloud with me. O oh God, who forgives our faults and heals our diseases, we cry to you. Our strength has been brought low, and we know not what the future holds. In our bodies there is pain, in our souls anxiety and unrest. If it may be, restore us to health. We ask no miracle of deliverance, and if in the order of nature our suffering must continue, Help us to accept it without rebellion. If it must lead us toward the valley of the shadow, help us to fear no evil, but to go bravely into your nearer presence. In your good keeping, all is well. Into your hands we commend our bodies and our spirits. Do with us as you will. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I'm Charles Anderson, one of your pastors here to remind you that God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. We continue this morning with our sermon series called Gospel Medicine, a series on faith and healing. And because our scripture this morning are words of Jesus that concern, well, concern the altar, uh, we decided that we would place our sermon time in a different place today, that we'd come back here to the main sanctuary of the church, and we'd preach from the altar from the very spot, the very place, the very experience that, that Jesus talks about in our passage today. So let's pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, because you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And if in the words of this one we hear not the voice of God, then please speak to each and every one of us in the quietness of our own hearts. Amen. As you heard a moment ago, our text comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And Jesus in Matthew 5 is stressing relationships, the importance of clear, open, honest, gracious relationships. And in order to make his point, he sets this over against the most significant and sacred moment that can be imagined, namely when you are kneeling at the altar which the Bible says is actually the center of life. The world came into being in an act of worship. The morning stars sang together and whoever kneels at the altar, well, whoever kneels at the altar is participating in creation, joining with the very beginning of time when God set everything to music and God made worship basic to all creation. Whoever kneels at this altar is at the center of life. In ancient times, Jewish priests, when they approached the temple altar, would wear a special robe covered with suns and moons and stars as a way of saying, this is the center of the universe. And when you stand at the altar, you stand at the center of everything. The altar is the oldest piece of furniture in the human race. Now think about that. Before we made houses, before we made chairs and sofas and dressers, before we even made patio furniture, the human race made altars. It's the oldest architecture in the world. The ancients believed that the world was supported on an altar. What kept the world in place was an altar. And if people ever stopped praying and praising, everything would go down. Now, in our text this morning, Jesus wants to make a point. Jesus says, I'm talking about something important. If you are at the altar, 
Do you feel it, the, the importance? It's sacred all. If you are at the altar and there you remember, and by the way, you will, there's something about the altar that causes us to remember. I think it must be the inescapable clarity we find there. After all, in the dim lamps of this world, you know, we can compare ourselves with each other and we all come out, come off looking pretty good. I mean, there's always someone that I can be better than. For instance, if I make a 71 on a test, you know, if I fish around long enough on the playground, I'll find someone who made a 63 and I'll feel a whole lot better. In the dim lamps of this world, we all think we have it made, but when we come to the altar, when we come this close to the reality of God, it comes down to just plain honesty. And I remember the flaws in the fabric of my own life. I face God as I really am, and I remember, just in plain stark honesty, what my life should be and what it really is. At the altar, it's all plain and clear. And Jesus says, if you're at the altar, and there you remember that someone has something against you, then leave the altar immediately. Go out of the house of God and get it right with that person. Straighten it out. Tend to it at that very moment. If you remember anybody has anything against you, clear it up. Because, Jesus says, there's one thing more important, more sacred, more significant than worship. And that's the way it is between you and her, the way it is between you and him. Call that relational healing. That's first. Relational healing is first, says Jesus. So go fix it. Go right now and fix it. Do you know what Jesus is talking about? I mean, this morning, do you know this need for relational healing? When you see her coming down the street, your first inclination is to cross this over to the other side of the street so you can avoid her. You know what Jesus is talking about, don't you? You work with him every day and polite enough, but sort of icy and, and never looking at that person, sort of always looking away day after day, working in the same building, but it's chilly. Well, what are you waiting for? Why don't you fix that? Oh, you say, but it isn't your fault. Well, of course it's not your fault. You didn't start this fight, this conflict. That's why Jesus says, if you remember that your brother has something against you. He didn't say if you have something against your brother. He assumed that would not be the case. He said, if your brother has something against you, you go and make it right. Of course it's not your fault but it is your responsibility to run from the altar and fix it because that's too heavy a burden to bear. There's ulcers in that, there are wrinkles in that, there are pounding headaches and wanting to quit the job and not wanting to ever see certain people in that. What a way to live. It's no way to live. If you're at the altar and remember, says Jesus, then go, go. The striking thing about all this is that Jesus in Matthew chapter five gives most of his attention to that primary relationship that we call family. Uh, what terrible, terrible things occur in what we call family. Oh, when it's right, there's nothing more beautiful, absolutely nothing more beautiful but the beauty and the right of it all aren't true all the time in every place. For instance, I know about a certain couple whose marriage was choked by hostility. One night, he reached his breaking point. He screamed at his wife, I hate you. I won't take it anymore. I've had enough. I won't go on. I won't let it happen. No, no, no. Then several nights later, he woke up in the middle of the night to strange sounds coming from the room of his two-year-old. He walked down the hall, stopped by his son's door, 
And what he heard chilled him to the bone. Inside, his son was repeating in a soft voice with precisely the same inflection and the same intonation he had heard. The argument that had passed between his mother and father. I won't, I hate you. I won't take it. No. Listen, if you are even in the sanctuary, offering your gift at the altar. And there you remember that you can chill a family in ways that will affect a two-year-old for the rest of his life. My goodness, what's holding you? It wasn't important. Well, 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 it really was important. They were arguing over money. He said she was spending more than he was bringing in. She said, you're not bringing in enough. And they fought that morning, fought at the breakfast table in loud, screaming voices. And then the baby at the breakfast table, sitting in the high chair, began to cry. Just just 14 months old. And mom and dad screaming and the child crying. And he slams out into the garage, blasts out of the driveway. And she picked up a saucer and threw it against the door and began to cry even more. And his car went down the street. She picked up that crying baby and held the baby close, getting ready to live through the longest day of her life. But then the car garage door opened. A car pulled in. He came back in and said, I'm sorry. And she said, I'm sorry. And the baby said, I'm sorry. And they just hugged each other. Listen, that would have been the longest day in the world. Not only waiting until five, but who's going to speak first? And you rehearse it all day and you rehearse it all day. And then all of a sudden the car came back. Listen, if you are even in the sanctuary offering your gift at the altar, and you remember that you sped away, please, immediately, go back, fix it. It's more sacred than the house of God. Anyone, anybody noticing, would see her sitting in the car by the playground. She still has her house coat on, sitting there with the motor running to keep warm. Do you know what she's waiting on? She's waiting on the school bus to bring her six-year-old. You see, 30 minutes ago, she and the boy were back at the house. The kid was as sluggish as a snail, and she's yelling, hurry up, you're going to miss the bus. Here's your sandwich and your apple. Where's your lunch kit? And the boy said, I don't have my lunch kit. Well, what do you mean you don't have it? He says, I lost it. She said, you lost it? That's four lunch kits this year. Your sister went through school and never lost one. Look, I don't, I don't care if you have any lunch. Get out of here. Go on. And that little boy goes out and he gets on the bus, still almost dark, so early they now go to school. Gone. Question. How long will it be until three o'clock? It will be 90 years and she can't stand it. Just got on that old flannel robe, but she drives to the school and parks there and waits so that when the bus, school bus pulls up, she can run over there and grab him and say, I'm sorry. Listen, there are some things in life more sacred than kneeling right before God and that's going to the school and waiting for the bus and saying, Mom didn't mean it. Do you know what Jesus is talking about? A friend of mine on an airplane, sitting next to a woman. She was obviously upset, cried the whole time. Finally, he said, this is a sad trip for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, well, I'm sorry that this is not a happy time for you. And she said, I'm going to a funeral. Well, it must, must be a close person to you, friend, family. She said, it's my father. He said, oh, I'm sorry. You and your father must have been very close for you to be this distraught. 
And she said, no, that's the problem. We weren't close at all. Well, what, was he ill for very long? She said, I don't know. My sister just called and said he was dead and the funeral is tomorrow. You don't know if he was sick very long? And she said, I haven't spoken to my father in 17 years. He said, 17 years? And she said, when I slammed out of the house, the last thing I said to my father 17 years ago was, you could go to hell. And he's dead. <clears throat> Is there anyone this morning who does not understand what Jesus is talking about? Do, do we really not understand this God deep urgency for relational healing? Now, yes, I know that we're online this morning and, and we're live streaming and we're not even in our traditional worship spaces here on campus. But in every home, in fact, in every room, in fact, in every interior space that we create inside our own lives, there is an altar. There's that sacred space where it becomes more real between you and God than anywhere else. Trust me. This morning, wherever you are, you are at an altar. If you're at the altar and there you remember the distance between you and someone who loves you and someone you love, I'm telling you, for their sake, for your sake, for God's sake, go fix it. Fix it right now. Here we all are at our altars. Do you remember anything? Please, today or in the morning at the latest, first be reconciled to that person and then come back. Come back to your altar. And God will smile and say, ah, yes, you know. You really know how to be relationally healed. Well, how good it is on this first Sunday in February that we can be the people of God gathering for the meal of God. This is the sacrament of Holy Communion. And as always, we invite everyone to come to the table as you have set it up in your own residence, your own home, your own place this morning. Before the service goes further, you will probably want to get some bread and something to drink and have those in front of you because as you gather in this online community, God in his grace, God in his miracle glory creates something out of us. Just like he creates bread into body and cup into blood, he creates a gathering uh, where there was none. So this morning we come here to this place we call sometimes the altar, sometimes the table. In United Methodism, it's not either or, it's both and. It's a table. This is where the people of God gather to celebrate the meal of God. It's also an altar because it reminds us that this meal has been given to us at a priceless price. And when we gather, we remember that Jesus, on the night which he, before he gave himself up for us, gathered with his disciples his brothers in Christ Jesus. And after the meal, he took bread and he gave thanks. And then he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. When Jesus had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from this each and every one of you, for this is my blood of a new covenant, a new agreement, a new promise poured out for you and for many others 
for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we who are many are made one in this meal. And we pray during this meal that the Holy Spirit might pour, be poured out upon us and upon this meal. That this bread might be the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This cup might be the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you and I might be the gathered people of Jesus Christ. So now I invite you, take the bread and take, eat, and remember that Christ died for you. Likewise, take the cup which you have before you now and drink of it. Remember that Christ died for you and for many others for the forgiveness of sins and that this is the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ poured out for you. And now, having received the bread, which is the body, the cup, which is the blood, let's pray the prayer that Jesus Christ also gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I hope that today's message resonated with you. And I also hope that you'll join us next Sunday as we continue our Contemporary Plus One series and as I conclude our Sanctuary Gospel Medicine series. You know, when we create these worship services, we have the goal of helping you become better followers of Jesus Christ with your presence, your prayers, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Now. Part of our call as followers of Jesus is to reach out and make more disciples. And if you're not yet a member of Clear Lake United Methodist Church, uh, whether you've been visiting us for one Sunday for several years, I want to invite you now to follow Jesus with us. You can let us know that you're interested in joining our church by checking that box on your online connect card at clearlakemethodist.org slash here, or by calling the church office. I hope many of you also marked your calendars for Ash Wednesday's February 17th drive-in worship service with Tony Vinson, and you marked the calendar for our first ever Sunday morning drive-in service on February 21. There'll be important foundations for the beginning of our Lenten season and a new church-wide project you'll be hearing about soon. So for now, we'll close our worship with our final song. And may you go out in God's grace and peace.